Thank you for asking me to speak today. Um, I'm an imager, I'm a cardiologist, and I'm at a structural heart meeting, so I propose to talk about the interface between pulmonary arterial hypertension and structural heart disease. I'd like to start with a case. In 2011, a 32-year-old woman was seen by a cardiologist at an external centre complaining of shortness of breath and fatigue. The first test that he did was an echocardiogram, which showed she had a dilated right heart, trivial tricuspid regurgitation, and a markedly elevated pulmonary artery pressure. She also had an aneurysmal intraatrial septum. A bubble study was performed, and this was negative. She had lung function testing performed. She had a history of heavy smoking. That was normal. And she had a high-resolution CT scan performed, which was also normal. She had a VQ scan performed to look for any evidence of pulmonary thromboembolism. It was negative. And she had sleep studies performed too, looking for sleep apnea. And they were normal. So at this point, she was referred to a specialty pulmonary hypertension unit where she had a right heart catheter performed. And she was found to have a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 32 millimetres of mercury, pulmonary vascular resistance of 2.8 wood units, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of 8 millimetres of mercury. And she had mixed venous gases of 91% and right atrial gases of 90%. And at that point, she was diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension and treated with warfarin, ambrosentin and sildenafil. And she was monitored every six months. Now it's April 2018 and she's now 39 years of age and she returned for her routine review and her routine echo. And this was the echocardiogram that was obtained in April of last year. <clears throat> and this is the um, four-chamber view. And you can see she has a big right heart. Her pulmonary pressures are elevated with a right ventricular systolic pressure estimated at 47 millimetres of mercury, assuming a right atrial pressure of um, eight. There was something else. We were a little bit concerned about the right atrium and whether or not there was something in there. So we optimised our imaging. And there was something in there. So there was a large bulky mass seen within the right atrium attached to the intraatrial septum. This was a bit of a surprise. And we looked across the septum and we thought we saw something else. So there's a blue jet that you can see passing from the left atrium to the right atrium. And then we went back and looked at the echo from six months before because surely this couldn't have evolved in six months and this is what we saw. So there was no mass in the right atrium at that time. There was an aneurysmal intraatrial septum and there does appear to be dropout within it. And so this was our report, or my report. It was a large mobile echogenic mass in the right atrium. We thought that was either going to be a myxoma or a thrombus. There was an aneurysmal intraatrial septum with a secundum ASD. The right ventricle was moderately dilated and there was mild systolic dysfunction. And there was at least mildly elevated pulmonary pressures um, with a pulmonary vascular resistance that were calculated by the ABBAS formula at 2.3 wood units. So I th think this raises a number of questions. Does this patient have idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension with a coexisting ASD? Is that even possible? Does the cause of the pulmonary hypertension matter regarding this lady's prognosis? She was a mother of young children, and the thought was if she continued to deteriorate, she was facing a heart-lung transplant. And specifically, how should we ma manage this patient? She's got a big mass in her right atrium. She's got an ASD, and she's said to have idiopathic arterial pulmonary hypertension. So in order to work out the answer to these questions, we need to look at a few definitions. Idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension is pre-capillary pulmonary arterial hypertension in the absence of any other cause. Now this, I understand, has now been changed. So the mean pulmonary arterial pressure, if it's greater than 25 at rest, they're said to have um, pulmonary hypertension, but now perhaps we're going to have to downgrade that to 20. When is it precapillary? It's precapillary when the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is low and the pulmonary vascular resistance is high. So it's not due to left heart problems. It's either, due, and if you have precapillary pulmonary hypertension, it's either going to be due to pulmonary arterial hypertension or due to lung disease or due to chronic thromboembolic disease. 
So in order to have idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, you need to be in group one um, of the classification system for pulmonary hypertension. The other groups apply to left heart disease or pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease or hypoxia or due to chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension or due to a mix of all of these. Now, if you do have um, pulmonary arterial hypertension, only a small subclass of those people are going to have idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. Sometimes it can be inherited. Um, there are certain genes that um, can give you a predisposition to develop pulmonary hypertension. Certain drugs and toxins um, can certainly do it. It can be associated with congenital heart disease, HIV, schistosomiasis, and pulmonary hypertension. So what is idiopathic pulmonary hypertension? What's the pathology? It's a severe arteriopathy where there's thickening of the intima, thickening of the media, uh, and there's plexiform lesions, which is the hallmark of the condition. There's vasoconstriction, um, there's vascular remodeling, and there can be in situ thrombosis, and these things all go together to increase pulmonary vascular resistance. The right heart initially compensates by dilating and hypertrophying, but eventually right heart failure occurs, and this is what ends up killing these people. It's rare. Um, there's a female pre preponderance. The average age at diagnosis is 36. The presentation is really non-specific, so patients present with fatigue, shortness of breath, possibly chest pain or arrhythmia. Um, and the outlook is grim. Because the symptoms and signs are uh, relatively non-specific, there's a, a long delay between the patients initially developing symptoms and finally getting diagnosed. So this is a paper by our previous speaker, Jeff Strange. So the average um, time it takes is more than four years between initial symptoms and diagnosis. And this is just a flow chart to show you what investigations are appropriate when. Echocardiography is an excellent screening test, but um, the right heart cath is the gold standard for making the diagnosis. So with echocardiography, you can triage patients into likely to have pulmonary hypertension or not likely. You can also see whether there's evidence of left heart disease or congenital heart disease. Um, once you've done that, if there's no evidence of left heart disease, it's important to investigate for pulmonary causes with lung function, CT scan, gases and a VQ scan if, if thought to be appropriate. The role of ECHO, it's excellent as a screening tool. It's very good for looking at cardiac consequences. It's very good at looking for um, left heart or congenital causes. And it's also good for prognosis. The formula that we use in order to um, ascertain what we think the pulmonary artery systolic pressure is, is the modified Bernoulli equation. Um, we're able to calculate pulmonary artery systolic pressure from the tricuspid regurgitation velocity jet pulmonary end diastolic pressure and pulmonary mean diastolic pressure if the patient has pulmonary regurgitation. So here's an example of a signal um, where we've measured the peak velocity, we've used the 4V squared formula and we've come up with a number for pulmonary art artery systolic pressure. If the velocity is greater than 3.4, the patient probably has pulmonary hypertension and if it's less than 2.9, it's unlikely. Now, um, echo is not enough um, in order to make the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, and that's because um, the pulmonary artery systolic pressure measured by Doppler methods from TR doesn't always correlate with that measured by um, right heart catheter, and certainly in the case that I showed, it didn't. It mostly doesn't correlate if there's insufficient tricuspid regurgitation, sometimes if there's too much of an angle of incination. It's much rarer to get a higher pulmonary artery systolic pressure by echo and a much lower one by right heart cath. That's relatively unusual. Sometimes that can occur if the images are overgained. We can also calculate pulmonary vascular resistance as long as we get a um, tricuspid velocity and we get a right ventricular outflow tract VTI. And I also mentioned this for Dr. Scalia. Um, the e plug can be used in order to differentiate precapillary from postcapillary hypertension. And in order to do that, you um, need to get a tricuspid valve velocity, a TR velocity, and an E to E prime, um, and work out the ratio between them. ECHO can look at the cardiac consequences of pulmonary hypertension. 
whether or not the right ventricle is dilated, right ventricular hypertrophy, flattened septum, as you can see here. And it can be useful for prognostication. So these are just a few of many parameters that can be looked at. Um, if the TAPSI is reduced, if the pulmonary vascular resistance is elevated, if there's a pericardial effusion, other parameters which you may wish to look at include um, right ventricular strain and right ventricular volumes as assessed by 3D. It can show whether or not there are cardiac diseases underlying the problem, whether there's congenital heart disease or left heart disease. So it's a very useful starting point. However, um, a right heart catheter is very important to confirm the diagnosis and also to get accurate hemodynamics, which can correlate with survival. And the other reason a right heart catheter is important is that in a small subgroup of patients with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, um, they may have um, marked vasoreactivity and they may be appropriate for calcium channel blockers. And if they are, they have the potential to have an almost normal five-year survival they're very, a small subset of that particular group. So now back to our case. Does our patient have idiopathic pulmonary hypertension? Um, there, there was an initial right heart catheter which showed um, the mean pulmonary artery pressure was 32. So that meets the criteria for diagnosis. And the wedge pressure was low, so that's consistent with precapillary pulmonary hypertension. But was there an absence of another cause? And is the ASD just a bystander? So although the ASD was missed on the initial echo, it was detected in 2013 on a routine echo with a bubble study with Valsalva. And it was confirmed with toe at the time and it was sized. But the diagnosis was never amended. So how, how could this have happened? So an echo, even with bubble study, may not show a shunt if there's little flow across the defect at rest. And in such cases, it's important to perform a Valsalva manoeuvre. And then coming to the right heart cath, one of the things that I noted was the oximetry um, at the right heart cath didn't, wasn't said to show an ASD, but the mixed venous sats were said to be 91%. So maybe the point is, given they weren't looking, they felt there was no shunt, they didn't really look for it on right heart cath. And how should this patient be managed? Well, ideally, they should have surgical removal of the mass and the ASD should be closed, provided they're a surgical candidate, provided it's felt to be safe. So when can it be closed? Well, if it's a bystander defect, a small defect in a patient who's got idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, it shouldn't be. If the patient has Eisenmenger's syndrome, where the, the pressures have increased to a degree that the shunt's reversed or it's a bidirectional shunt, it shouldn't be closed. But there is a group in the middle who've got moderate um, pulmonary shunting and the pulmonary vascular resistance is only mild to moderately elevated and they may be correctable. So this is what happened to our patient. Big clue, operative toe. You can see they still have a mass. You can see the, def the defect with the, the flow going back and forward. This is the bubble study that was done. I think it was actually just propofol that was given and happened to give us a bubble study. And you can see that it's like a negative contrast study. There's no bubbles going across that defect, but you can see the negative effect of the jet going left to right. So you can see how it could have been missed on the original bubble study. And this is subsequently. So the um, mass has been removed and the ASD has been closed. And what was the mass? It was a myxoma. So we weren't sure. We thought it, it seemed to have developed so quickly. And yet when I reviewed the literature, myxomas can do that. We don't actually have much idea of, of the time course of development of a myxoma. And how did the patient do? They did quite well. They had an episode of pneumonia, but once they recovered from that, they did well. And an echo six months later showed a normal right ventricular size, low normal systolic function, with a right ventricular systolic pressure of 32 millimetres of mercury. And a right heart cath showed a pulmonary artery pressure, or a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 21, which is still above the 20, and a pulmonary capillary ridge pressure of 8. So in conclusion, idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension is precapillary pulmonary hypertension where all other causes have been excluded. And it's vital to get the diagnosis correct because pulmonary hypertension due to other causes may have a completely different outlook. This lady was looking at a heart lung and now she's doing extremely well. The diagnosis depends on meticulous performance of echocardiography and right heart catheter. So this is when proving having a myxoma proves lucky because all of her data was looked at again. 
and stranger things have happened. Thank you.